Placed under close watch, these French citizens are arriving from Wuhan, the epicenter of the new coronavirus. They are to be immediately quarantined. The day before, the World Health Organization, under pressure to act against the spread of the virus, declared a state of global emergency. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. The main reason for this declaration is not because of what is happening in China, but because of what is happening in other countries. Initially, the WHO was divided over the issue, and they relied on the Chinese government's drastic measures to control the crisis, a strategy, however, criticized by some researchers. Literally, it seems like scientific community hasn't learned a lot from the previous outbreaks in SARS. The same kind of situation has been. At that time, we knew how we controlled it, but all those efforts came very late. WHO is not taking that thing very seriously. While the uncertainty remains over the nature of the virus, other experts think that the WHO's reluctance may be justified. When it comes to the requirements that must be met when declaring an international emergency, the present situation is far from clear-cut. It's hard to tell. While a few thousand cases have been detected, the real figure is probably closer to 100,000. There are still too many unknowns to estimate the virus's lethality. According to the WHO's definition, an international public health emergency is defined by a situation that is serious, sudden, unusual, or unexpected. It must carry implications for public health beyond the affected state's national borders and may require immediate international action. Created in 2005 in response to the SARS epidemic in China, this exceptional measure has only been used six times, but its usage is no stranger to controversy. In 2014, while the Ebola epidemic spread across Western Africa, the WHO waited two months before sounding the alarm. The international organization then faced accusations of neglecting the recommendations of the medical personnel on the field. Emails made available to the public show that the organization wished to avoid measures that could be perceived as hostile by the concerned African countries due to the potential negative impact to their economies. Of course, in cases like this, the stakes are enormous at all levels, political, business. I'm sure our colleagues in charge of Africa at the World Health Organization were under a great amount of political pressure. States and governments never like to be singled out when a scary epidemic shows up. In China, despite Beijing's efforts to eradicate the virus, the disease has still spread across the globe, leaving the WHO with no choice but to act, all the while making sure to safeguard China's interests. What is very important in this announcement is that we were told it isn't useful to take measures that can harm international trade and tourism. I think that it's a sentence that has been strongly negotiated in Geneva as to avoid panic within international trade. The risk of panic, something the WHO was unable to properly handle during the H1N1 epidemic in 2009. The international emergency had then pushed states into investing massive amounts of resources to counter the virus, leading to the production of millions of unused vaccines. The fiasco tarnished the WHO's credibility. To this day, it remains the international public health emergency's most significant scandal.